Hi, it's Paul Allison. Out here in New Jersey running. It's October 2nd, Yom Kippur, 2006. This is my video podcast. Gonna reflect a little bit on some things about writing and um, correctness and genre and blogging. Reflect on what my students put up last week. And I want to think about my plans for this week. While I'm running here, I've been listening to podcasts. And uh, right now I'm listening to Hard Rock Radio, Davy D's Breakdown FM. And, uh, Chuck D's on, and some other rappers on this show. It's a great show for me. I, I learn a lot about a culture I don't know, listening to this podcast on a regular basis. And of course, I'm using that as an example for what I want my students to do. We'll get to that in a second. I'm talking about an interesting CD that just came out called Rebirth, Rebirth of a Nation. Sounds like some good songs on there. Scary stuff too. <laughs> just listen to one about shooting bush. <laughs> okay. Really, I, uh, been listening to, uh, David E. for about a year now, and, uh, really learned a lot. Keep learning, too. He had a recent show right after Hugo Chavez's speech at the UN about Bush being a devil. And then Charles Rangel coming out and saying that was wrong for him to do. Next day, David D had a show up. It was an old recording of H. Rap Brown comparing house Negroes with field Negroes. <laughs> and Rangel's speech mixed with this analysis of uh, people who have sold out to the master and people who haven't. Interesting show. What uh, David E's show does is it almost always pushes me beyond Give me new borders to think within. And uh, that's what I appreciate for it. So there. This is my review of uh, one of my favorite podcasts. Davy D's Breakdown FM. So, my first kind of topic that I want to look at has to do with... Uh, what my students have been posting at youthvoices.net. They've been posting now for about two weeks. In addition to working on a, the mapping project having to do with putting a place on the map about introducing themselves in New York City to others who will be using their blogs as well. 
Um, so my concern comes from you know, looking at what the students have posted. Some students have posted just one, others two or three, uh, a couple more than that. But uh, many students have posted now. And there is a procedure that I go through, which after doing some free writing of various sorts and focused writing and um, writing about images and just writing all over the place, students are asked to take that writing and edit it and work on it in Microsoft Word and make sure that the grammar and spelling is correct and so forth. There's uh, no peer editing going on with that yet. Um, but I have emphasized that from the get-go. And some students don't even do that step. They, they still post. And I haven't prevented them from posting. I've been encouraging them to get up whatever they can get up um, in order to get this ball rolling. But once it's rolling, we've got to really, really look at correctness. and. Uh, and uh, making things um, nearly as perfect as we can online. Now actually, how perfect they need, things need to be is still within some conversation. You know, it's not quite like publishing a final piece, it's, and it's uh, also not a journal piece of writing. It's uh, somewhere in between there, isn't it? So, and also Will Richardson has recently pointed out that uh, the ability to edit once you post something, um, editing online, is an important skill for kids to have. So, hey, <laughs> maybe it's a joke, but when I read that I thought, oh, what an opportunity my students have created for themselves. They can now learn how to edit all that stuff they put up online. And I do think we should take some time and do that, although I can't interfere with the process of new material, the writing new material. So that's, of course, the trick, is uh, having students work in both modes at different times um, on the blog. I think they can do that. Certainly the tool allows them to do that. Whether I can get them to do that will be another question, of course. The bigger, I think, really kind of deeper, certainly not surface level, question has to do with uh, genre and purpose and audience and form. You know, it's said in my school that uh, humanities and English teachers, 6 through 12, teach writing with a genre perspective. They, uh, they teach genres such as um, anecdote and uh, vignette and uh, personal narrative and then moving toward um, argumentative essay and investigative journalism and so forth. And perhaps into some disciplinary writing, although I don't see very much of that, I gotta say. The genres they present are, um, to my mind, not really genres, because the students have very little sense of audience in the writing, except the manufactured audience, perhaps, and they have little sense of a purpose for the writing. So yeah, I'm going to tell this story about my mother and father breaking up and how upset I was about it. And I got to, uh, you know, be careful to use a certain kind of verb. And so there's focus on form to, to an extent where the student is just doing what the teacher asks them to do, largely. Um, students get back papers that are corrected and, you know, whether it's used with red marker or purple marker or pencil, it's still incredible editing that teachers do. Lots of work thrown into that. And uh, students get better grades if they respond to what the teachers ask for. If they can make the corrections the teachers um, 
require of them. And in the process, really very quickly, the students lose interest in their writing. It's not their writing anymore, and certainly if they ever had a sense of audience, that's gone too. And uh, it's really kind of upsetting in some ways. Now, on the other hand, if you look at the blogging work that I have students do, it's quite the opposite on all these scales. They have a very clear sense of audience or not needing audience if they're doing journal writing. Um, well, in that case, they're, they're themselves are the audience. But when they're blogging online, they really do have a pretty clear sense of audience. And um, the audience responds to them, and it's a real piece of communication. Um, so the purpose becomes uh, evident and understand, understandable to the student. Uh, what form they're using, though? What, what? Um, uh, and and there again uh, is where some of the uh, lack of good use of language and, and lack of any kind of thoughtful structure is missing from some of the blog posts that they put up. And so I'm not at all satisfied with that work either. It's got to be somewhere in between. So this is one area of question that I'll return to, I'm sure, but that I want to work with students on and other teachers to help me think about. Uh, what we want kids to do when they post on a blog, because I, you know, I had a student who had written a vignette, 10th grader, and I said to her, you know, why don't you put this up as a post on your blog? And she said, why would I want to put this up? Nobody wants to read this. <laughs> it was just a school assignment. So how do we move from school assignments to personal writing? And from personal writing back to, uh, you know, experiments with form and um, correctness and all of that quality that we want in a blog post. You know, part of the answer is to ask that question that we've been asking, how do you get attention? And you get attention by, uh, with so much, with your correctness, I think, as well as your content. <laughs> You don't want to distract from your blog post because of your the quality of your writing. And I think what many of my students have put up so far does distract from the content. So, you know, <laughs> I'd much rather deal with the technology, right? I'm very excited still about all the tagging that they do on their posts and, and how these tags are becoming clouds and they can see what's important to them to be writing about and how they're learning to make links and, and insert images and all of it. <laughs> it's pretty exciting. Um, the, uh, however, when you start really working on the writing aspect of, of blogging, then you have something to really wrestle with. And the question always is, how much to intervene and how much just to let the process of communicating with other students um, create the need for correctness and the need for um, a particular kind of uh, genre that doesn't give up on audience and purpose or form. So that's my goal. My uh, second and really final topic for this video cast um, is about my plans for this week. The future. And uh, something happened very recently that has made me shift my goals. I was going to ask students to set up Bloglines accounts, and even many of them did last week. Uh, not a terrible thing to do. They'll have that kind of as a backup. But, uh, Google Reader has changed their interface and 
it's a much cleaner, faster, easier to use, um, nice aggregator that allows podcasts to be played and um, I'm going to use that I think instead of blog lines. So I experimented with pulling together an OPML file out of my own blog lines. I put, oh, it ended up being 14 um, podcasts that I think are somewhat appropriate, short some of them. Um, uh, the one I described at the top of this video uh, is in there too, though, however, and might not be considered as appropriate and certainly is not as short. Um, but, you know, NPR Story of the Day, UNICEF Podcast, um, Youth PRX, Youth Radio kinds of things, uh, um, Alt PRX, um, there's even a gaming podcast that's about a 25-minute podcast. Um, give you some sense of what's there. Um, oh, uh, Latino USA and um, African American Roundtable. Uh, so, so uh, some key to my mind, world news of the day as well from NPR. Uh, some key uh, repurposed uh, radio broadcast that we can use as podcast um, to introduce podcasting to students and for them to g really get into some content um, on their own blogging, in their own blogging. So hey, maybe I'm beginning to answer my earlier question. Having something to write about is certainly going to create some genre, isn't it? Uh, the subject. Um, at any rate, um, I did export a an OPML file that pulls those 14 uh, RSS feeds right into Google Reader, and uh, so I put that in the file um, in a community called Podcast on YouthVoices.net, so they can just save that file to the folder, open their Google Reader, which, by the way, all of them have because they are all now. Um, subscribed users with uh, um, uh, with Rightly, and if they're using Rightly, then they have access to Google Reader as well, free access to Google Reader. So that's kind of sweet. It worked out pretty nicely, I think. So yeah, um, and that's on my uh, my grid, my rubric, uh, my guideline for what I'd like them to do. So a short week, I really only see students Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Um, and uh, so three times this week. So I don't know if I can really require them to go full, full into um, doing two posts. Um, maybe it's okay to kind of slow down and say, Go through all 16 steps, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll put a link to the 16 steps that I've imagined um, on this the description that goes along with this this uh, video. So that's my hope today, this week, is to add podcasting using um, Google Reader. So i uh, kind of excited about that possibility, and uh, I do really think that um, this will add kind of a needed component to, to my teaching, so that uh, they'll have something to respond to. Alright, I think that's about all I wanted to talk about. Um, Ongoing journals of Paul Allison <laughs> at uh, Eastside Community High School. You can uh, reach me at Allison, A L L I S O N P R, at gmail.com. And uh, find me on teachers teaching teachers dot org. Um, if you want to find me also, you can find me on YouTube. My username is Paul R. 
Allison, P A U L R A L L I S O N. I'm going to talk to y'all soon. Bye.